Amen. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to Hosea. Hosea chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5. I was at a wedding yesterday, and I had no clue what was going on in world events. I've been a little distracted. Um, I used to be much more aware of things, and then all of a sudden I heard that Iran was attacked, had attacked Israel, and they're at war. Um, and it, it's kind of sad that here I am at, a, at a, a marriage, which is a peaceful thing, hearing about this act of aggression. And uh, for those of you who may be concerned, um, you should read Psalm 83 sometime. A Psalm 83 actually talks about very local uh, uh, governments and peoples attacking Israel and being defeated soundly by Israel because here's the deal whether you like it or not the Jewish people are God's people he is not going to allow them to be wiped out and and what I thought I would do is I thought we would we would exercise our spiritual muscles and and work our way through what I call the context of the whole I believe that that context is so important in understanding God's word Without the proper context, you can take things out of context and make them say things that it was not meant to say. And sometimes some well-meaning Christians will do that. They'll take a passage and they mean well, but they take it out of context and then they, they ba basically lead people down a, a road that could uh, cause problems in the future. Also, you have cults like Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons who take the Word of God and purposely take it out of context and mislead people into eternal destruction. And Islam is also another, uh, I consider it a cult myself, um, is another cult that does the same thing because they believe that Jesus is uh, the perfect man, the sinless man, but they don't believe that he's the son of God. They, they believe he's a prophet, but that's it. And, and is Jesus a prophet? Yes, he is. He is a prophet, but he's so much more than just a prophet. But I, I trust that I don't have to convince you here of that today. So in our Bibles, let's go to Hosea chapter 5. And what I want to talk about is the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay? I want to talk about the return of Jesus Christ. And, and, and while, you're, while you're thumbing down to verse 13 of Hosea 5, let me, let me read this verse from Titus 2.13. Titus 2.13 says, We are to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's got a twofold plan for planet Earth. And we're going to take a look at that plan. We're going to, and we're going to, we're going to go all over the scripture. So get your fingers ready. You know, you hope your fingers can do the walk. You know, remember that old commercial, do your fingers do the walking in the yellow pages before they had the Google? You know, well, our fingers are going to walk through the, the scripture pages because we're going to be all over the scripture. Um, so if you're taking notes, I would just, uh, I would, you know, well, it depends on how fast you can write. <laughs> um, but first, let's take a look at... Hosea chapter 5, verse 13. Hosea chapter 5, verse 13. It says, When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jerob, Yet he cannot cure you, nor heal you of your wound, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim. And like a young lion to the house of Judah, I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away, and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would take this passage and that you would give us understanding that we'd be able to put it in the proper context. And Lord, again, we lift up Israel, Father God. We pray that you would protect Israel and that you would defeat the forces of the Iranians who are the aggressors and that Israel would not be uh, put into a, a bad place, Lord God, but instead, excuse me, that they would have victory over their enemies, Lord God, and then perhaps maybe, even maybe, those armies of Iran would see that that there is a God, 
and, he, and that he is the God of Israel, and that they would repent of their sins and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. In this passage, I want us to see Israel's, first of all, Israel's failure. Secondly, Israel's punishment. But then, if, thirdly, Israel's loss, but concluding with Israel's redemption. Okay? And so, in verse 13, it says, When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jerob, Yet he cannot cure you, nor heal you of your wound. God is rebuking the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel broke into two parts. Okay, I'll give you a little historical context. You had the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, the southern kingdom, which is called Judah, and both kingdoms were messing up. They were failing to do what God called them to do. God called the Jewish people to be a light to the Gentile nations. And instead, they took their exalted position and they got proud. And they basically put down the Gentiles as, and called them dogs, goyims and stuff, and developed a very, very unfriendly uh, attitude towards the rest of the world, which is not what God had intended. In fact, when Israel left Egypt, there were Gentiles that left with them, and God said, do not exclude these people from the congregation of Israel if they are willing to have their men circumcised and if they are willing to follow the laws of, of Israel, then include them into the covenant because you guys were once foreigners in Egypt and how were you treated? Don't you turn around and do the same thing to the foreigners that are amongst you. Our God is a righteous God and a holy God. Amen. And so you're saying, well, Nelson, how does this have anything to do with the return of Jesus Christ? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked that. And so what I want us to look at is I want us to look at God's covenant with Israel because we need to have the, the context of all the scriptures, not just one passage. There's, there's too much preaching from just a single passage and developing ideas and concepts that are not, not consistent with the whole. And so for the first passage of scripture I want us to uh, go to is I would like for us to turn to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7 is a very interesting chapter because Genesis 7 is a blood covenant between, uh, excuse me, not 7, 17. Um, Genesis chapter 17. In, in Genesis chapter 17, uh, wait a minute. Uh, yes, yes. In Genesis chapter 17, God makes a, makes a covenant with Israel. Why am I not seeing what I want here? Oh, because I'm in 7. <laughs> That's why. Okay. Yeah, let's let's get it right. Okay. Genesis chapter 17. Oops. Verse 1. Stop it. <laughs> My phone is not behaving itself. There we go. Genesis chapter 17, beginning with verse 1, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and, and, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I will... For I, will make, for I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you in their generations. For what? For an everlasting covenant. So this covenant that God is making with Israel is forever. It doesn't, it, a lot of Christians think, oh, a lot of stuff terminated when the Old Testament was over and the New Testament started. No, the New Testament does not terminate the Old Testament. It actually fulfills the Old Testament. So the first thing we need to understand is that Israel has an eternal covenant with God. 
All right, let's go, let's go back a little bit to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Oh, come on. In Genesis chapter one, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, and from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And notice what verse 3 says. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. History has shown this verse to be fulfilled over and over again. The greatest empires of the world that have oppressed the Jewish nation have all been brought to ruin. The first one was Egypt. Egypt in the days of Abram uh, was the dominant world empire. And God told Abram that your descendants are going to go into Egypt, they're going to be their slaves, they're going to be abused, but after four centuries I'm going to pull you out and I'm going to bring you into the land that he just talked about in this passage, a land that flows with milk and honey, the land of Canaan. And the Egyptians abused the, the Israelites and they were destroyed as a world empire. Where is Egypt now today? But they're not the only ones. The Babylonians are the ones who replaced the Egyptians. They abused the Israelites as well. And for those of you who don't know, the Babylonians are the modern day Iraqis. Where is Iraq today in the world stage? How powerful is Egypt? How powerful is Iraq? Not very. Okay? The following empire that kind of abused, but then kind of didn't abuse, was the Persian Empire. And those would be the Iranians, modern day Iranians. And what kind of power do the Iranians have? In the terrorist world, they're, they're big guns, but in the world at large, without the United States funding them, they would not be able to do the things that they're doing. And then finally, the Greeks. The Greeks conquered the Jews, and they also abused the Jews by a guy through Antiochus Epiphanes, who was an Old Testament model of the Antichrist, and he abused the Jews. He tried to put an altar of Zeus in their holy place. And the Jews were so infuriated that Judas Maccabeus and his sons led a revolt against the mighty, mighty Greek empire. And they won. And where is Greece today on the world stage? How powerful is Greece? Finally, the last empire to really abuse the Jews was the Roman Empire. Because the Romans abused everyone. They were the most tyrannical empire. When they, when, they, when they messed with you, you went down and you went down hard. One city refused to acknowledge Roman coin. So you know what the Roman Empire did? They, they attacked the city and they sold every single person in that city into slavery. Only, simply because they wouldn't accept Roman coin. The Romans were, in fact, they took great, great pleasure in what they could destroy. And there have been other nations that have kind of abused. The British Empire abused the, the Jews in the 40s, in the 30s. They told the Jews that they could go back in the land, and then they turned around and told them they could go back in the land. And where is Britain on the world stage today? And there's one nation, though, that actually invited the Jews to take refuge in it. And that nation is the United States of America. Our first president, George Washington, invited the Jewish people to come and take refuge in the United States of America. In fact, what a lot of people don't realize and know is that during the Revolutionary War, the majority of the funding for the, the Continental Army came from Jewish businessmen. Because I think these Jewish businessmen realized that these Americans want to follow the Bible, the Word of God, and that's our book. At least the Old Testament, they believe, is their book. And so I believe that they probably had some insight as to if this nation succeeds, we might have a, a safe haven. Because the tale of the Jew has been they've been chased from country to country 
to country, and they always get blamed. Wendy and I just watched Schindler's List the other day and watched the horrific treatment of the Jews. And where is Germany on the world stage today? Not as powerful as the United States of America. Now, granted, we're not perfect. We're very sinful, and we've got some real, well, not good leaders uh, in control of us right now. But hopefully 2024 will change that. Um, and maybe sooner. Uh, keep that in prayer. Um, but, but the bottom line is, God said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. You want to be blessed? Bless the Jews. Okay? Um, I'll never forget... Um, Scotty and I, when we were painting a house in Great Barrington, we ran into a, a businessman who ha he had a cross and a Star of David hanging from his... And, and Scott asked him, well, why, why did you have that? And he goes, we found out he was a Christian and that all his best customers were Jewish and he was prospering because he did good by these Jewish businessmen. So let's, let's not kick against the goads. Let's learn our lessons. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. President of the United States of America. But not only has God made a covenant with their descendants and promised them that he would bless those who bless them, he also made a covenant with them that they would be his priests eternally. Turning your Bibles with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 25, beginning with verse 10. The next couple of verses, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel, because he was zealous with my zeal among them, so that I did not consume the children of Israel in my zeal. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and his descendants after him a covenant of what? An everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God and made atonement for the children of Israel. What happened here was the Jewish people fell into idol worship, Worship. They married some women that were, that were not Jewish women. They began to worship idols, and God broke out against them, and Phineas attacked a couple that had a Jewish man and a Jewish wife in marriage, and he slew them. He ran them through with a spear, and God stopped his plague against Israel. And because of his zealousness, God said, I'm going to make Aaron's priesthood an eternal priesthood. Right now that priesthood is on hold, but it is not discarded. Okay? We, as the church, we are also kings and priests unto our God, but we have a different priesthood. We have the priesthood of Melchizedek, where we're not just priests, we're also kings. Because if you study the Old Testament carefully, a priest was not to be a king and a king was not to be a priest. And one king that tried to be a priest ended up with leprosy all over him. God smote him with leprosy and stuff. So the two offices were separate. But in the church, we've been given the privilege of both offices of kings and priests unto our God. Revelation 1, verses 4 through 6. You can check that on your own. So God's covenant with Israel is eternal. It's not going to end. So Iran... Give up your quest of trying to destroy Israel. God's not going to forsake them. You are not going to defeat them. You are not going to wipe them out. In fact, you're only hurting yourself. Because God said, I will curse those who curse the descendants of Israel. And in fact, what has transpired over the years is that a lot of the rabbis and Jewish leaders, they realize that Israel's best friends is not the United States government. It's the evangelical community of Christians that believe in God's word, that take God's word literally. So what else, what else are we dealing with in this return of Jesus Christ? Well, if you go back to, um, if, you, if you go with me in your Bibles, I want to share with you, uh, the con you know, the context of the whole as far as the rapture. I want to talk about the rapture for a minute. 
So let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13 and following. And we're going to read right through to chapter 5, verse 11. Because in the Greek, the first half of 1 Thessalonians 5 and the second half of 1 Thessalonians 4 are connected. There shouldn't be a division break between the end of 1 Thessalonians 4 and the beginning of 1 Thessalonians 5. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with them him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Pretty straightforward, but it continues on in chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, I have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. For you are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also doing. 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and then we who are still alive and remain, <clears throat> and remain at the time of the rapture are going to join them in, in a twinkle of an eye. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. We're not going to go there. Um, actually, we are going to go there. We're going to, let's, yeah, let's go there right now, real quick. Um, because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us the timing, and it tells us what's going to happen to us. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, and, and, and chapter 4 and chapter 5 tells us that, that this time is going to be like, it's going to come upon the world like a thief in the night, but we who are Christians should not be should not be fooled by this. We should, be, we should understand knowing the times of the, the signs of the times. I was at a wedding yesterday and a woman who had sat under my teaching before came up to me, she goes, so where are we on the, the, the prophetic timeline? I said, we're in the end of the end times. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, the church has always been in the end times, and we've been in the end times for almost 2,000 years, but Bible prophecies are being, being fulfilled, Israel being back in the land being the biggest one being fulfilled, and these tell us that we're not just in the end times anymore, but that we're actually in the end of the end times. Because we know that the rapture could happen at any moment. It's imminent. Amen. And it's going to happen at a time that a lot of people think not. And a lot of people aren't going to be prepared. And you say, well, how do you get prepared? Two things. First, to get saved. Secondly, study God's prophetic word. Shame on any evangelical church that does not teach its, peop its people these truths. This is our blessed hope, which Titus tells us to look for. But there's a second element to a more terrifying element to this, the return of Jesus Christ. But we'll get to that in a minute. Right now, I want to talk about the blessed hope. Guys, we could be raptured at any moment. It could happen right now. 
I, I, I do pray that it happens in church because I know when I'm in church, that's when I'm most focused on God. Amen. Right? You know, you know and, and especially it's Sunday morning. Now, Sunday night, I might be watching my football teams lose and it might slip in my sanctification. That would be a bad time for the rapture to happen. So I record games and then watch the ones where my teams win so that I know that I'm not going to be mad. Um, and, and, and it brings a lot of peace to the family and it doesn't scare the dog anymore because I'm really loud and, and I'm very boisterous as if you haven't figured that out but um but the rapture is it's imminent it could happen at any moment and that should be a warning to those of you who are not saved you could get left behind and you don't want to trust me you don't want to be left behind okay but let's turn to first corinthians chapter 15 and take a look at this rapture thing again from another perspective 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, beginning with verse 50 through 58. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses, beginning with verse 50. But now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. You ever feel like, how could I ever inherit God's kingdom with my, this flesh I have? Well, Paul explains what's going to happen. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That term is a euphemism for death, by the way. That was also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 4 and clarified when it said the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. And you know what the difference between the dead in Christ being raised and the, those who are alive and remain? Not a blink of an eye, a twinkle of an eye. I would say 10 to the minus 43 seconds because that's the smallest measurement of time in quantum physics in quantum, and math does not lie because math has rules and you have to follow the rules in math it's not like English where we break the rules all the time in English but in math, math has rules I've always been a favorite my, my favorite uh, subject in school was math because I'm a rule guy I like knowing what the rules are. I like knowing what the boundaries are. And I don't like it when people get away with breaking the rules. That bothers me. Especially when it comes to my country. But that's another topic for another time. Anyways, continuing on in this passage. So, for this corruptible must put on, I'm in verse 43, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Yeah. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thank be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So when the rapture happens, several things are going to happen. First of all, it's going to happen in a twinkle of an eye. Secondly, only the church is going to be taken up. God's going to harpazo. That's the Greek word for to snatch up. He's going to harpazo. And in fact, that word harpazo infers that it's like a pickpocketing. God's going to pickpocket us right out of this world. And you know where he's going to do it? In Satan's kingdom. Because Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And it says that we're going to meet the Lord in the air. It's like Jesus spiking the ball in the devil's face going, yeah. I have my people. You've been trying to destroy my church for 2,000 years. Guess what, loser? It didn't work. Amen. And we are going to receive glorified bodies. Philippians tells us that we will be like Jesus. What did Jesus do when he was resurrected? from? Jesus could show up in a room, even if it was locked down tight, without passing through a wall, a window, a ceiling, or a floor. It just show up. And then, I believe in our glorified bodies, we're going to be able to do the same thing. Can they kill Jesus now with his, with his glorified? You know, Jesus does have a body, right? Because he told, he, he said, Thomas, 
touch me. I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and blood. We're going to have flesh and blood bodies, but they're going to be glorified. But they're going to be bodies like the bodies that Adam and Eve had before they sinned. Bodies that were designed to live forever. Do you know that the human body replaces every cell every seven years? Why do we die? Because God said, the day you sin is the day that you die. And when Adam and Eve sinned, the glory of God was taken from them and they were naked. See, they were naked before that, but they didn't know that they were naked. Because the glory of God covered their nakedness. But when the glory of God left, what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together because they were naked. Okay? And so, there's going to come a day when our nakedness is going to be removed from us. I'm telling you, that, that makes me very happy. I'm a very, very private person. I had a couple operations, and the most horrific thing I ever heard in my life was, take all your clothes off, including your underwear. That I would rather die than do that. That's just me. I, I have a phobia, I guess, or something. But, but I did it. And I put on the dress that they call Johnny's and went through the whole shebang of surgery and stuff. But, but there's going to be a day when there'll be no more nakedness ever for us. In fact, we're going to be given glorified bodies, clothed with the glory of God. Amen. <laughs> That's so awesome. I can't wait. All right. So when does this happen? When, what separates the rapture from the second coming? I'm glad you asked that question. You guys are really smart. You're asking some really good questions. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. A lot of people who think that God is, is done with Israel, you know, well, the church has replaced Israel and God's done with Israel, blah, blah, blah. And, and, then, and then, of course, I bring up these eternal covenant things and they're all, well, that's Old Testament, Pastor. That's, we're in the New Testament. Blah, blah, the Old Testament's been replaced by the New Testament. We're the new Israel. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. So turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 11 beginning with verse 25. This is Paul talking to some pretty cocky Christians. He says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion... He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them, when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, <clears throat> but concerning election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts, listen to this verse, for the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. That's for both Jew and Greek. You get saved, you're saved. God doesn't take back your salvation. Or the gifts that he's called you to, you know... I'm going to be preaching for all eternity because my gift is the mouth. I'm a mouth. I like to talk and I like to preach and I like to talk about Jesus. And I think that's what I'm going to be doing through all of eternity. I hope, I hope I get a chance to preach to new worlds, to boldly go where no man has gone before to fulfill my Star Trek fantasy, right? <laughs> anyway, continuing on, for as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained a mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient through the mercy shown to them, shown you, so that they may attain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has given to him, and it should be repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen! Amen. Yes. So, to answer your question, what separates the rapture from the second coming, it's in verse 25, where it says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Somewhere on planet Earth, at some time, the very last person who is going to become a member of God's church is going to get saved, and the rapture is going to happen. Now, we don't know who that is, we don't know where that's going to happen. We don't know what country, what time. We just know that it's going to happen. And so this church, we've kidding around saying, hey, 
If you're the last Gentile, can you do us a big favor and get saved already? We want to go home. But you know what? I've modified that a little bit. I don't want to go home until the job's done. Because the very same Jesus who told us to watch for his return also told us to occupy until he comes. It's our job to conquer the world, not with our military, not with our finances and our corporations, but with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there have been prophecies that God is going to use America like a launching pad of a spiritual renaissance in the world where millions of people are going to get saved before the rapture. That excites me when I hear stuff like that. And I believe that's going to happen. And that's why I pray every day that this country be a righteous place. Right now, we're not a righteous place. We have an evil ruler. And we are evil as a nation. Because when God looks at a nation, he looks at the ruler first. And our, our present day ruler, he's evil. And I said it, and I'll say it again. And you know what? His cohorts on the right are just as evil. Those rhinos that are going along with them, they're evil too. And the Democrats, that's why I call them Democrats. And if you're a Democrat, I apologize. I don't believe that all Democrat voters are evil. I just believe that, they're, that their candidates are evil. Okay? Um, and I'm not real happy with the Republicans either. So I get, I'll, just, I'll just anger both sides and, and be done with it. But it's the last Gentile coming in that separates the blessed hope from the glorious appearing. Now, how does this glorious appearing work? Well, we got to go back to Hosea. So go with me back to Hosea. Hosea chapter 5, with verse 13. We see in verse 13 Israel's failure. What was their failure? They failed to turn to God, they turned to a human king instead. And God says, That's not going to help you. That's like trying to put a band aid on a gaping chest wound. The blood's just going to blow it apart. Huh, I wonder if that's a pun that the Holy Spirit wanted. But anyways, Ephraim went to King Jerob, and God said, King Jerob can't cure you. They should have known better. Not only that, he says, he will not heal you of your wound. And then look at what, how mad God gets. In verse 14, Israel's punishment. It says, For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away, and I will take them away, and no one shall rescue them. You see, Israel was still in their land. Okay? And, and God punished them first. He punished the northern kingdom first by bringing in the Assyrians who took them captive in about 720 B.C. and brought them into, made them slaves. And then a little over 120 years, about 120 years later in 606 B.C., God brought in the Babylonians to conquer the southern kingdom and punish them and make them slaves. And that started the servitude of the nation where they were no longer were in control of their own destiny. And they've been at the mercy of the Gentile world ever since. Ever since. And God said to Ephraim, I'm going to be like a lion. I'm going to rip you. What do lions do? They rip it's their prey to pieces. And that's what God did to, 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 to Ephraim, the northern kingdom. That was another, that's a synonym for Israel. Okay? And then he says to the southern kingdom, it's even worse for you because I'm going to be like a young lion. Young lions are more ferocious because a, an older established lion is a little more calm because he's established. But a younger lion is trying to make a name. And so a younger, younger lions are more vicious than older lions. Because they want a pride. <laughs> okay? And God's saying to them, I'm going to punish you like a lion. How sad. But then look at verse 15. Israel's loss. Verse 15. This, now this is God speaking. He says, I will return again to my place. Let's stop there for a second. In order to return to your place, you had to leave your place in the first place. Right? 
if this God, if this is God talking, who in the Trinity left his place in the first place to return to his place? Jesus. This is Jesus talking. Amen. Well, let's see what Jesus has to say. He says, I will return again to my place until they what? Acknowledge their offenses? No, their offense singular. What single offense did Israel commit against Jesus Christ? They rejected his claim as their Messiah. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Yep. In April 6th, 32 AD, Palm Sunday, Jesus pronounced a judgment against them. He said to them, if you had only known the time of your visitation, but because you do not see it, you will not see me again until you see me sitting at the right hand of the Father coming down in glory. Ooh. And what will happen when they acknowledge this offense? Then they will seek my face. And in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. What affliction is God talking about? He's talking about the tribulation here. Understand this. The tribulation is not for the church. There are preachers, there are some preachers out there that are telling their flocks the church is going to go through the tribulation, that we need to buckle up because we're not holy enough, we're not righteous enough, and therefore God can't save us from ourselves. That, that's, that goes contrary to the Word of God. The book of Hebrews tells us that we are saved to the uttermost. The, the, the book of Romans tells us, it says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, we shall be saved. It doesn't say that our sanctification has to be perfect. It just says that we have to have faith. Amen. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why I brought you to all these passages so that you would have the same faith that there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. A difference between the glorious appearing and I mean, the, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing. And for other scripture passages that back this up, turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. We are doing a Daniel series, and I will be getting back to that Daniel series. But I, I, I didn't feel like God wanted me to do, a Dan, to do Daniel today, per se, other than verse 26 and 27 of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. It says, And after 62 weeks... The Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be like a bee with a flood. Until the end of war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offerings, and on the wing, on, and on the wing of abominations shall one who makes desolate even unto, until the consummation which is determined and is poured out on the desolate. Now that sounds like a lot of mumbo-jumbo words. But if you dive into the Greek, first of all, we have to define what the weeks are. It's, the weeks are not weeks as we think, uh, seven days, it's actually seven years. And actually, um, there, there is, this prophecy has actually 70 weeks. And if you read in verse um, uh, uh, chapter 25, it says there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So, but what's going to happen after the 62 weeks of years? Which actually is added, which actually is um, um, 49 weeks of years, which is 483 years altogether which is 173,880 days. Aren't you guys impressed? Does, does, does that make you excited? It should, because God has given, gave Israel a very specific prophecy to the day. See, Artaxerxes Longimanus gave Nehemiah the prophet the right to rebuild the city, the walls, the streets, and the temple. It's the only decree given by a Persian king that allows the Jews to do all four. The other three covenants that were given only gave them the right to rebuild the temple only. But this particular one was giving Nehemiah the prophet the right to rebuild the city, the street, the walls, and the temple. And you know when it had occurred? 
I know when it occurred. On March 14th, 445 BC. And if you count 173,880 days, you land on April 6th, 32 AD, the very first Palm Sunday. The Jews should have known that. Jesus said, you did not recognize the time of God's coming. I gave you the date. I told you about it. You've memorized these whole books. What is your problem? You know what their problem was? They weren't listening to the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, the Pharisees are impressive. We, we, we put down Pharisees. And yes, they were hypocrites. But so are we. We're hypocrites sometimes. Can you say that you've never been a hypocrite? If you say that, you're lying. Your nose will grow, okay? So, you know, but we beat on the, oh, those Pharisees are such hypocrites. Well, maybe we should take the log out of our own eyes first, okay? But these guys could quote whole books of the Old Testament from memory. Can you, Isaiah, it's got 66 chapters. And there were dudes that could quote that book from memory. And you know what the Pharisees believed in? They believed in the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the unrighteous. They believed that there were angels. They believed that the Messiah was coming. Who does that sound like? Don't we believe in the, the resurrection of the righteous and the unrighteous? Don't we believe that there's angels? Aren't we waiting for the Messiah to come back? Amen. So how are we any different? Covenant. We're part of the new covenant. And guess what happened? On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, oh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, guess what happened? A lot of those Pharisees got saved. And I know they got saved. You know why? Because they started trouble in the church. Because then they turned around and said to Paul, well, those Gentiles, they have to become Jews first before they can become Christians. And Paul says, okay, you're nuts. And Peter said, uh-uh. I preached at Cornelius' house, and they received the gospel, they spoke in tongues, they received the Holy Spirit, and they got born again, without becoming Jews. So no, Pharisees, we're not going to reestablish the old covenant. There's a new covenant in town. Amen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so, this passage in Daniel 9 shows us a gap. Do you know that that, that the Antichrist doesn't come yet? <laughs> Did you know that? Okay. And he was predicted that he was going to come almost 2,000 years ago. So there's a gap in between the prophecy and the Antichrist coming. And who's been serving God in that gap? The church. <laughs> so who's been living in that gap? The church. And do you know that there's 24 of these gaps in the, in the Bible? We, went, we, we had a class one day where we covered all 24. Actually, it took us more than one class. It took us a few classes. But we covered all 24 gaps where the church is living in the gap. And this is the, this is the wildest gap of them all. Because the gap between Jesus being crucified, which is in verse 26, after 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, or karat. That word cut off, the phrase cut off comes from the Hebrew word karat, which means to be executed for a capital crime. What crime was Jesus executed for? Treason. Because he called himself a king. And, I, and he was in Caesar's empire. That's treason. And he was executed. But not for himself. That's what it says. But not for himself. Who is Jesus executed for? Himself? No, for us. For the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but will have everlasting life. Jesus died not for himself but for us. But then it says, and notice in my Bible there's a semicolon which means there's a break in the verse. And it says, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of wars desolations are determined. We know what happened. Jesus prophesied against the Jews and 38 years later the Romans came in and leveled Jerusalem. And so the prince that shall come has a Roman connection to it. And the prince that came at that time was Titus of Vespasian, but he's just a model of the ultimate prince that is to come to destroy Israel, and that is the Antichrist. 
And in verse 27, it shows us what this Antichrist is going to do. He's going to confirm, actually in the Hebrew, it should be, it should be translated, he's going to enforce the covenant. What's the covenant? The, the sacrifices of lambs and goats on the altar. Because look what it says. Then he shall, and I'll, I'm going to put, I'm going to say enforce, even though my, my Bible says confirm. And he shall enforce the covenant with the many for one week. How, how many weeks of years? One. That's seven years. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate. In other words, he's going to stop the sacrifice. He's going to enforce the Jewish covenant during the tribulation for three and a half years. But then in the middle of that seven year treaty that he makes with Israel, he's going to break that treaty and he's going to make things desolate. He's going to attack the Jews. Until when? Until the consummation. What's the consummation? The consummation is the end, folks. That's what the consummation is. He's going to be able to do that until the end of the tribulation, which is determined and is poured out on the desolate. If you're not saved, you're desolate. You're an object of God's wrath. And so, what separates the rapture from the second coming is the completion of the church and then seven years. Let's, let's take this baby home. Let's go back to Hosea. Look at what it says at the end of chapter 5. It says, Then they will seek my face. After they acknowledge their offense. Singular. It says, Then they will seek my face. There's going to come a time when Israel is going to realize, oh, Yeshua is Hamashiach. Messiah, the King. And in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. And it continues in chapter... See, actually, the first three verses in chapter 6 should be part of chapter 5. Okay. It says, come, let us return to the Lord. Who's talking now? Israel is talking. For he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. And he will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. What's my thesis? Let us pursue the knowledge of God. Amen. And God will come to us. In this covenant, the Holy Spirit comes to us. And we become born again. And we become part of God's church. And we are seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. By the Holy Spirit. And we are connected to each other. We're, we're organically, spiritually, and emotionally connected to one another. And what happens to us happens to Jesus. I know that because that's what Jesus said to Saul. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? What was Saul doing? He was persecuting the church. Why didn't Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why, don't you, why do you persecute my church? He said, no. He said, why are you persecuting me? Because when the church is persecuted, Jesus is persecuted. That should make us stop and think twice before we attack a fellow Christian. Because when we attack a fellow Christian, we attack Jesus. Food for thought. And so... The Jews, when they acknowledge their offense, that will bring the end of the tribulation. Oh, and by the way, they're the ones that started it in the first place. How do I know this? The Word of God. Turn with me real quick to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. I know this has gone on a little bit long. I apologize. But I needed to give you the whole picture. It's important that you have the whole picture, not just part of the picture. I am. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 28, verse, beginning with verse 14 and 15. 14. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14. Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol, we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. Daniel 9 and this passage here tells us that the tribulation starts when Israel makes the covenant with the treaty with the Antichrist.
And they're going to think, well, and, and the Jews do this. You, you notice they never say anything bad about any of our presidents, even the ones that abuse them, because they're afraid. And they figure, hey, I'll just let them beat me up a little bit, but they'll protect me. It's kind of like a bully syndrome, right? The weak kid thinks, oh man, if, I, if I'm nice to the bully, the bully won't beat on me. Well, it doesn't work that way. The bully is just a bully because a bully is a bully. And the way you deal with a bully is to punch him in the nose. And you make a bully think twice about coming at you. But, but scared people allow bullies to push them around. And Israel allows the Gentile world to push them around. And they're going to allow the Antichrist to push them around. They're going to make a treaty with him. And he's going to enforce it. And he's going to seem like their friend for three and a half years. But then at the end of three and a half years, he's going to turn on them like any bully does. And so the Jews are going to realize who the Antichrist is. And guess what? They're going to turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, save us. As a nation. They're going to say, Jesus, save us. How do I know that? Because remember what we read in Romans? Romans 11, it says, and all of Israel will be saved. Is that right now? Is all of Israel being saved right now? No. But when the church is raptured out of here, and the tribulation's been raging, and the Jews acknowledge Jesus as their Messiah, and they earnestly seek his face, they're going to cry out to God, and all of Israel that's on the earth in that day will be saved. And guess what? It gets even better for them. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah 31, verse 31. It's easy to remember. God's going to create a new covenant with them. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will pour my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. Turn with me real quick to Zechariah 12.10. Zechariah is the second to the last book in the Old Testament, right before Malachi, or Malachi, the Italian prophet. That's what my Italian pastor told me. Zechariah 12.10 And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they will look upon me whom they've pierced, who got pierced? Did the Father get pierced? Did the Holy Spirit get pierced? This is Jesus. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and will grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. And one last passage, I promise. Isaiah chapter 59, the last couple of verses. It's again talking about the new covenant. But I just want this rammed into your heads. That God is not done with Israel. So if you hear some crazy preacher tell you that God's done with Israel, run. Turn him off and run the other way. Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21. And the Redeemer will come to Zion. Who's the Redeemer? Jesus. That's right. So Jesus will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord, we, we saw what that was. Their denial of him as Messiah. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Amen. So what does that mean? That means that the Jews who survived the tribulation are going to be sealed like us, the church. But not only are they going to be sealed, but their children are going to be sealed. And their grandchildren, and their great grandchildren, and their great 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 grandchildren, and their great 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 grandchildren forevermore. In the in the millennial kingdom, no Jew will be thrown into hell. 
Gentiles will. Okay, there are some Gentiles that even though Jesus is ruling on the earth, they're not going to believe. They have a hundred years to accept him and they don't do it and so they get cast into hell. But not a single Jew will because God has, will seal the entire nation. All of Israel will be saved. When God says all, he means all. Not part, not some, not most, but all. Isn't our God awesome? And we can... And we can take that to the bank for us. God's gifts and callings are irrevocable to us too. And God has not saved us partially. He saved us completely to the uttermost. So what do we have to lose? Not a ting, man. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that Iran would wake up and smell the coffee. I pray that our government would wake up and smell the coffee and get right with you. Father, we again pray for Israel. We pray for the protection of this, its citizens. This unprovoked attack, attack is evil. Lord, I don't know where the UN is. They're useless. But Lord, I know that you are a God who sees. You watch everything. And you, and you have books. You're, you're recording things in books. And these people will be judged by those books unless they get saved. And then they'll be, they'll be judged by the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Lord, that which we have our names written in for those of us who believe in you. Father God, again, we pray for those Bibles that were handed out by the Gideons this, these past couple weeks, that they, would, that they would not return that void, but they would accomplish what you set them out to do, that people would get saved, sanctified, that Christians would be encouraged, that churches would be built, and that you would be glorified. And Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.